all we have achieved since 1937 rests on this foundation. This is the area most intimately associated with the People's Rebellion of 1937. It, it tells us about how we're paying tribute to all who built this country, including those who were here before modern settlement in 1625. The, 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 the Amerindians who were here were driven from here, but they were nevertheless the guardians of this land for centuries. Come, join me on a journey to a place where history was created. A place where an ordinary group of people proved that they could effect extraordinary change. A place where a people dared to say no, dared to say enough was enough, dared to stand up and say better must be done. This is the story of the man, the people, the place. This is the story of Golden Square. For Golden Square, it's significant, it should be significant for every black person in Barbados. Um, what Golden Square represents for us is not just uh, another beautiful place to just go and look at and look to see if you see your name on the wall, but to really understand um, the, the poverty that Barbados was in at the time in, in relation to the, the working class, black working class people. On November 27th, Barbados opened a park like no other. Located in the heart of the city, Golden Square is a reminder of how a small group of people changed history. This was the very area where mass meetings were held in a depressed area in the city. Meetings which were organized by late national hero, the right excellent Clement Payne. This was a congested working class district. And it was here that Clement Payne found acceptance. The people of this district, who were probably some of the most you know, oppressed, um, uh, some of the poorest and, and, and most suffering people of Barbados in 1937, they embraced him, they embraced his message, which was a message of uh, um, working, working class people needing to organize and to fight for their rights and to fight for a better existence in Barbados. So he was embraced here and he began to use this space as the main venue for his public mass meetings. One of the reasons why riots or a revolt occurred here in 1937 was that people had no outlet, no outlet to vent their grievances. Bakers were locked away in bakeries in the evening and they're, they're baking in the, in the night and the, the manager locked them away, goes home to sleep comes back early in the morning to open the door for them. A very dangerous situation with fires. Those are the conditions that people uh, had no recourse of changing. To better understand the significance of Golden Square, you first have to understand the conditions under which people lived prior to the riots. This is one of the houses here. You have the shingle roof. You have, it was a wooden house made of pine mm -hmm. and so on. So it, this would give you an idea of the type of housing that was in Golden Square in those days in 1910, which was um, about 27 years before the riots took place. So here are the board and shingle houses. See the shingle roofs, the, the dilapidated pieces of wood, and the privies or pit toilets. They were called privies in these days. And here's one with the, the door not properly affixed. These are the conditions that led to a lot of diseases in those days. These are the conditions that people were complaining about, asking the authorities, asking the platter merchant elite to do something about them, but no result. And that places the context for the revolt of 1937. So this was not just a revolt um, that was meaningless. This was a revolt for socio-economic betterment. So while these people 
used pit toilets and lived in dilapidated houses, the planter elite were living in mansions, stone mansions, with all the facilities, and these workers were oppressed. In 1939, um, the, the governmental authorities did a survey of Golden Square, and they discovered um, 1,386 households in this, in this small district. So there were two commissions of inquiry. Um, the first one was a local Barbadian commission of inquiry called the Dean Commission of Inquiry. And one of the witnesses that gave evidence at the Dean Commission of Inquiry was Reverend um, Errol Pilgrim of the, the Bethel Methodist Church, which is right here, abounding Golden Square. And in his testimony, he testified that the people of Golden Square were so impoverished that they could not afford to drink, to consume milk. I mean, he said that milk was relatively cheap, cheap in Barbados, but the people of Golden Square had to make a choice between milk or um, something more, a diet, something more substantial, a more substantial item of diet like fish. And, um, and obviously they went with something more substantial and therefore they, 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 it was a choice they had to make so they could not drink milk, you know? So it was as, it was as bad as that. We have a picture here of Queen's House where the meetings took place. And interesting to note, persons were so excited by this commission of inquiry into their um, conditions at the time that you can see the park was crowded. We have persons with their hats. And in those days, persons used to always wear a lot of hats. Hats was part of the wear. And people were excited to hear what was going on and to have for a son, a for a son hearing um, of the evidence um, that was being provided to the commission. It's hard to believe that not long ago, this area behind me looked like this. This change was set in train years ago, when, as Minister of Culture, current Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley had the vision to transform Golden Square into the cultural haven you see today. She, along with then-representative for the city, Lieutenant Colonel, the Most Honorable Jeffrey Bostick, were on hand to witness the moment when Golden Square was officially opened. She shared what Golden Square represented to her. That forever more people in this country should remember that there were those who were prepared to stand up to make a better life for our people. And they risked their lives, they risked their liberty, all to begin to make the point that the conditions under which they were living were unacceptable, and, and we view it, as I said in my speech this evening, as lessons in life, because everything that we want doesn't come how we want it or when we want it, and what we must remain is committed. This space here must always remind us that we must see people, we must hear people, and we must care for people. And if, in essence, that's really all that democracy and government is about. How best can we live together? I would like that 50 years from now that this place would become to be known as the catalyst for the redeve redevelopment of Bridgetown, the reimagining of Bridgetown. Because Bridgetown 50 years from now must be a place that is beyond even our imagination. And so when I look at this place and what is happening across the street and uh, Fairchild Street and the Carinish project which goes right up to the globe, and with the refurbishment of Queen's Park to become a center of excellence for art and so on, this is the making of a new Bridgetown, a Bridgetown that will bring people back to the city because, as you know, Bridgetown at this point in time is relatively a dead city. And so also when we see what happens with the Treasury Building, the old Treasury Building, to have people living in the heart of town, I would like to think that 50 years from now, that this would have been the springboard for the actions to come. When Golden Square was officially opened, Prime Minister Motley stated that it was a gift to the people of Barbados. She was, however, specific about how she would like to see it being used. By all Barbadians, with respect and with care, 
I want it to be a place of education, a place for reflection, a place for entertainment, um, a place for agitation, even in terms of people being able to speak. Um, this is a place really that allows people to be the best that they can be if we allow it to be. So that we come here and we see the public art, we come here and we see the wall of memory, we come here and we see elements of old Barbados in that magnificent piece of public art by Ras Akim and Ras Aishi. Um, we come here and we also recognize that we can have entertainment. Yeah. I think you yesterday asked me about the screens for movies mm -hmm. and we just need to make sure that we put some speakers so that it's not just the visual you'll get. So we're hearing you. And, and, and I hope that we will begin to appreciate that with Golden Square Freedom Park, Independence Square, National Heroes Square, that we are slowly redefining the center of town to be in our image, but above all, all else to be inspirational. In 2019, the president of Suriname, um, Desi, the Honorable Desi Bautusea, gifted us these benches here once he heard what we were trying to do to commemorate this Golden Square Freedom Park. And I really want to thank him and the government and people of Suriname for their solidarity in wanting to associate with Barbados at this point in time. Um, we kept the benches, we didn't know when we would open, but as you can see, they've been kept and installed now in good shape. The wall of memory is particularly poignant for me because this wall of memory we settled back as far back as 1998, 1999. In fact, some of the bricks were started as far back as then. And that's why I said this is a lesson in life because it has taken us 22, 23 years to get here. But at no stage did we move away from the vision because we believe that this is inspirational. It, it tells us about how we're paying tribute to all who built this country, including those who were here before modern settlement in 1625. Now we're going to give them, you know, a, a visual representation on the wall, okay? So I, I cannot see definitely a name, but I know that we had some of the bricks, okay, that were rejected for a reason or another. And we just decided, you know, you know, with the, the brick layers, okay, we decided to make a design on it to represent basically, basically, the Amerindian, the Arawaks. And this to me was very, very satisfying, as well as I, we could include as well, you know, the <coughs> indenture workers as well, okay? That we had no specific names. The darker bricks are the enslaved that were killed between, and I'm repeating it again, between 1700 to 1800, okay? And this list again given to me by a historian. So we are commemorating by this wall those enslaved people who struck a blow for freedom and who were utterly devastated after that revolt. Many of them houses were burned. Then they were executed in spectacular fashion. In other words, there were people who were bought or brought to Bridgetown. For example, we have um, enslaved Africans who were brought down here and executed in a public ceremony. Enslaved Africans who were brought to Trent at Trent Hill and executed in a public ceremony. Here in Hill in St. John, Enslaved Africans were brought there and executed. And the biggest one, Joseph Pitt, Washington Franklin, brought to that area just outside the old and More Health Center. Barbadians called it Hanging Hill in those days. Hanging Hill and executed. And that is why it is important for us to memorialize these people. These people will never get in our history books because very few articles, very few um, pieces, historical pieces will ever mention these people. Very few records are available. And that is why it is important 
to have their names here to show that they lived and they died. And that is why this monument is such an important one for Barbadians who can look back and reflect on that journey where we have come at this stage. Barbados was essentially a slave society. And that's why you hear me say that regrettably, we also passed that iniquitous piece of legislation, the 1661 Slave Code, that came to characterize how badly African slaves were treated throughout the Americas. And, and, and that we can move from that very, very low point to where we here are today is an example that anything and anyone and any place can be redeemed. And we have systematically worked about redeeming this country for the people who are the majority in this country, but recognizing, as I said earlier, that once you have victory and once you attain freedom, it is not yours to mimic those of the actions of the oppressor. When people come and look at the wall, they should not look at it like if it is a telephone book. Okay? I wanted to make sure that it will be an interactive wall. So in other words, you don't come here one second and you see your name right away. No. I wanted you, you know, to, to look and to have a bit of difficulty actually to find your names. Your, your, your name, or I'm saying your names, because in some cases I saw some classes, you know, looking for their grandmother, their grandfather, and so on and so forth, uh, which, you know, became a real competition, how many names of their family they would find. That would come a bit later. Anyway, so to come back on the names, okay, that it was just, it was definitely, I wanted to have, I wanted the people to interact with that, with that wall, which was one of the reasons why, the A's are together, but not following the same manner as the telephone book. And definitely not alphabetical. Absolutely not, okay? The reason for that, in my opinion, is also that you're going to learn a lot from the wall. A lot of people say, well, wait, I never saw that name in my life. Golden Square is not only a beautiful space located in the heart of the city. It is a reminder that once upon a time, a small group of people changed history. It is a tribute to those who laid on their lives that we could enjoy many of the benefits that we do even today. This square is telling us that when we, when, we, when we think about our identity and we think about our history, yes, our identity is um, bound up with victimization and suffering, but also, but also with courage, resistance, resilience, and with a deep commitment to freedom and humaneness and human dignity. And that is, that is what we are as, as a people, a complicated people, yes, but, uh, um, we should, uh, but, but a very positive and um, remarkable people that have had some of the most difficult conditions to contend with the first, the world's first out and out slave society never losing sight of that goal of freedom, always fighting for it. I'd like us to remember that this was the place that sparked the evolution of the modern Caribbean. Modern Caribbean democracy, modern Caribbean workers' rights. Um, it was because of this rebellion here that less than 12 months later, just a couple hundred yards away in Bay Street at Martineau House, that the Barbados Labour Party was formed. It is because of this site that within three years of the riots, um, four years, three and a half years, four years, that the Barbados Workers' Union, which spent the majority of its life at the corner of Fairchild Street and Nelson Street, just a couple hundred yards away again. It is because of this rebellion here that these institutions exist. And when you begin to understand how these institutions spawned other political institutions and unions in the region, you begin to see that this is at the center of modern democratic and political development in the Caribbean. So that um, what I want people to remember that even in our deepest, darkest days in a COVID pandemic, in an IMF program, that we found it within us to do this project to celebrate the majesty of the resilience of Barbadians who lived and on whose shoulders we stand, to be reminded always 
that it is within us to reach higher and higher and higher. Can you imagine um, as a family not having food um, to give your children to eat and desperate and hopeless? You could not complain to a union. A union did not exist. So you could not complain to anyone. Um, and there evidence also of, you know, you, you working at um, you working at companies and there was no overtime, there was nothing like that. So just imagine a world without all of these structures and, and, and services and so on that we have now. That is how it was in Barbados. So I think Golden Square should always be a memorial to where we came from. And we will be able then to appreciate what we have a lot more um, in understanding the significance of Golden's career. And it should be taught in schools too. It should be told to every Barbadian um, what took place in, in Golden Square. And not only what took place in Golden Square, but the results of what took place in, in Golden Square following um, those, those decades after 1937. This square is reminding us of what our history has been and the national mission that that history has bequeathed to us. I really want to thank David Comijong and Trevor Prescott and Bobby Clark and all of those who went before because believe you me, they carried this battle when others didn't believe in it. So, if you haven't been as yet, there's really only one thing left for you to do. Come on, meet me at Golden Square.